So there are kids who need the coach to show up. That's not, you know, for me to try and become rich. You know, I could go out and people ask me all the time, you know, you ran track and you did this. I know I look a little heavy, but I can still run. I can still dribble the ball and I can actually coach it. Mm -hmm. But that's not for me to try to get other stipends. That's a skill that was given to me and I need to know what it's for. For me, it's to be inside the classroom. I use all of those features of coaching to get kids to the other side. And then when they made it to the other side, I say, now where you want to go? Because the other side is not the destination. And I think that's the response. I, I, I wish I had um, some of my students who could tell their stories. Um, and I wish that it was legal to share uh, more about it. But I can tell you that I, I have kids who could not read a word, you know, walk in. And they are reading now. They were supposed to be reading by second and third grade. But now, when they pick up the book, they're not holding their heads down. They're not embarrassed. I have kids who wouldn't sit down for anybody. And you know what? Pe people always said, well, Miss Body, you're really, really tough. No, I, I told them I'm the most flexible teacher you'll ever see. I'm very structured. I'm not mean. My kids love me. However, my no, it means no. They respond to it because they know that my no means love. They know that I love them. And they know when I say, when she says no, it's not so she can have a break at her desk. Her no means we're about to get down and do something that's going to be so fun. It's about to change my life until I'm 35. And then I can handle it from there or until I'm 50. I really believe this, that I go home with my kids. And I, you know, I have my kids. Um, one is so funny. One of them told his grandmother, I just don't know what I'm going to do with her, without her for the rest of my life. And his, his grandmother's words were, to him was, I think you'll survive. And that blessed my life because I really don't want them to be handicapped, but I want my kids to feel like that lady meant something to me, and I wish I could have her with me for the rest of my days because what she says matters. I, I cannot say enough up to every educator to be responsible enough to say, I, I, it's not about the accolade. It's about being the teacher of the year for the students and the parents and the clients that you serve in that, in that district. You know, because it's not just the teachers and the, and the parents only, because grandparents are worried of whether or not their grandchild is going to be successful. They're worried about, is she going to make it home and okay? Is she going to be bullied at school? They don't even live with their grandparents. Not all grandparents are raising their kids, grandkids. And so I look at things like of that nature and I start to, um, I start to consider myself, what is it that, that I need to be doing? So, you know, there are a lot of hats in my classroom. There's the parent hat, there's the educator, there's the exhorter, there's the person who's dedicated to making sure that I teach them life skills in third grade. Um, I make sure that I don't, I don't trust anybody. I mean, the first day I was telling my parents, I hope you trust me after I say this to you, but I don't even trust you. Not yet, because I don't know that you're going to tell them what I tell them. Number one, you didn't take the test to have to tell them. And so I have to trust me to get them there. And I think that most, most teachers that we see, they want to do really, really well. My encouragement is, if that's the case, then do well. And so, so what you're saying is <clears throat> you want uh, the other educators that are out there to, one, uh, basically win every moment, or be the teacher of the year every single moment, and also uh, be the teacher that that young person needs uh, from an individual perspective and then also from the holistic perspective, which is those individuals who are in that classroom with them. So, so talk to me about the challenges of our young people of today. What, what are some of those issues as we uh, close our show out? Talk to us about that and then if you could just share briefly about some of the challenges that teachers face where if there are parents who are listening, what they can do to help not only the student but also the parent. Well, one of the biggest challenges that we face right now is that we're trying to prepare kids for where they are living right now. You know, there are kids who have to have medicine and there are children who um, to, to survive and we've taught them that if you don't have the medicine they don't expect to survive. We've taught them that because perhaps their parents or the neighborhood that they live in is dilapidated. Well you know and I hear it. I, you know, I cannot tell you that most educators they don't know. Some of us do the very best we can with what we have but there are some limitations because their relational capacity has not yet been set very well for us to extend ourselves beyond what we saw as a child or what we experienced even um, when you start to talk about um, the racial gaps. The, mm -hmm. It's not just academic gaps, there are racial gaps. There mm -hmm. are things, um, 
there are actually health gaps where people have not experienced. So when I look at what we deal with, you have a young, you have a group of kids that's coming in now mm -hmm. who have problems that we have to face. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to thank you very much for coming in uh, and visiting with us. And I'm sure we're going to have to have you back, specifically when we deal with just education. And maybe we'll have a, uh, additional teachers that will be on here so we can really hear about specifically what we can do from a community perspective to help your job or to help you as an individual and also help make your job much more easier. Thank you for tuning in to the Real Talk with Johnny Riley. We just finished talking with Ms. Tina Body. What an exciting speaker, and it's especially an individual who has reached the goal of being the Teacher of the Year. We ask that you continue to tune in with us because we have some additional topics to talk about on our next show. Welcome to Real Talk with Johnny Riley, your host. I'm here with Dr. Brian Matthews. I want to thank you uh, for being here with us today. And I know we have some exciting things we want to talk about. And typically when I, I bring a guest on the show, this question that I ask all of our guests is, who is Dr. Brian Matthews? That is, that is a very interesting question. If you were to ask my eight-year-old son, uh, he would actually say that I'm an old man. Mm -hmm. uh, but Dr. Brian Matthews is is a individual that loves giving back. Uh, I, was, I was actually raised by a single parent. Uh, my mom and um, my brother and I um, pretty much grew up together. We, I'm, well, I'm actually from Wilton, Arkansas. I went to school in Ashdown. And uh, my grandmother and my mom actually taught me the, the value and the importance of giving back uh, to put self last and put others first. Uh, to be compassionate toward people, uh, to be an inspiration to people, uh, to be able to impart wisdom to people, and and to to become as as an integral part of other people's lives as I can. And and so for an individual that that actually grew up in a very small town, um, I actually have a very big heart. Uh, whenever it comes to uh, my eight-year-old son, uh, he would actually attest, and and hopefully he would agree with me that I'm a, one, a wonderful dad. Um, he was actually born in, in 2006, and so he, he is my heart, he is my joy. And so again, whenever you talk about who Dr. Brian Matthews is, he is a, an individual that loves to give back. And, and that's good for, uh, for me to hear that, that uh, through your upbringing, uh, you were taught by your mother and also uh, in conjunction with your brother on giving back to the community. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that is, uh, I think, what we like to focus on here on our show is uh, talking to you about what made you decide to say be a person in the community that's willing to give back when there's so many other people in the community that there's so many particular issues that people are dealing with but you say they're issues I have issues everyone has issues but I'm going to step over and above my own selfish desires I'm going to give to others what drove you what did your mother say is there a slogan that she said or something in school that caused you to say I want to be a person who gives back in our community my, my, my grandmother interestingly enough uh, she was very old school and my grandmother did not finish high school uh, but she was an individual that impressed upon my brother and I the importance of education 
And one of the things that she would always tell me, and I will never forget this as long as I live, my grandmother passed away in 2012 on Father's Day, so it was June 17th. And one of the things that she would always tell me is that wh whatever it is that you possess for yourself, no one can take that from you. And I've actually used that and, and stood on that foundation, especially when I go into schools and I mentor, you know, whether it's, you know, one high school teenager, whether it be male or female, or whether I talk to an auditorium full of students, you know, I would tell them that the education that, that you obtain, the experiences that you encounter, once you learn from those and garner what you need from those, no one can actually take that from you. You know, that is yours. You can possess that. You can own that. There's a level of autonomy and, and authority that actually comes with, with ownership. And in regards to giving back to the community, my grandmother always taught me to be a part of change. She, she was an individual that she impressed upon my brother and I that if you actually have a problem, then be a part of the solution. And, and even, even in my endeavor to run for city council and to be a city council member, I, I wanted to be a part of change. I wanted to be an individual that was integral in making things happen in the community, uh, being a part of transformation and, and texture kind of morphing into a better city, our communities morphing into better communities, um, our people I mean, enriching their lives because they live in a better community. And so that's what actually drove me to want to give back. Mm -hmm. So I, I noticed you said uh, Dr. Brian Matthews, uh, Ash Down, uh, now small town, now you are a, uh, a person who's in a political position with power and influence. So what you're telling me is, is that your background of uh, where you were born doesn't indicate specifically where you're going to end up in life. It does not. Um, one of the things I tell teenagers, especially in the school systems, and one of the things that I even uh, impart upon my son is that only you determine what your future is going to be. TISD actually has this concept called mental time travel. And it's an interesting concept because in, in your mind, you're already successful. You just have to go through the formalities to get to this successful point that you want to be at. Um, and granted, I, I grew up in Wilton, uh, maybe 333 people there, at least is what it says on the population side. Uh, but my, my mom always inspired me to dream big. Uh, she, she always wanted me to think outside the box. Uh, the world was more than just Wilton. It's more than just Ashdown. It's more than just Texarkana. Uh, there's a myriad of opportunities. Uh, that I can actually choose from. I just have to decide and, and stay focused and determine exactly what I want to do. My mom graduated from high school, started working at, um, I guess it was Nakusa at the time, whenever she graduated, um, and then it transitioned to um, Georgia Pacific and then to, to Dumtar. And she always impressed upon me to, to, to go to school, to go to school. I couldn't play sports in school because she wanted me to focus on my academics. Um, so I graduated from high school in 97, uh, went to Harding University. Uh, that same year, uh, graduated in 2001 in July uh, with an undergraduate degree in marketing. And then I went on the next month into grad school. Um, was there for a year and a half, graduated in December 2002 uh, with an MBA in management. And then I moved back here to Texarkana. Um, my mom steadily over the course of the years um, encouraged me to, to go back and get my doctorate. And so in 2010, um, enrolled in Argosy University online and within a two and a half years I actually had my doctorate in in uh, business administration with a concentration in marketing and so regardless to whatever your background is what upbringing you may have had uh, what hardships you may have had what hindrances you may have had you can determine what you want your outcome to be and that's very interesting that you bring up your mom only had a high school diploma but she encouraged you to go on and complete your doctorate uh, what kind of conversation did you all have? What did she say to you to say? Did she say, son, you're going to do this? Or did she just encourage you? How, what did she do to, to motivate you to move, up, move on further? You know what? My, my mom always talked about generational curses. And she didn't want there to be this repetition of mediocre outcomes. And it was never a question as to whether I was going to school. Uh, she never... Uh, gave me the option as to whether I'm going to college or not. 
Let's stop right there. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back. Texarkana, Texas Housing Authority is leasing units at the following properties in the historic Rose Hill community. Rose Hill Ridge, 1201 Stuckey Street, one, two, three, and four bedrooms. First lead platinum property in Texas. Call 903-794-7673. Pecan Ridge, 2210 West 15th Street, one and two bedrooms. Call 903-255-0455. The Oaks, 2100 West 12th Street, one, two, and three bedrooms. Call 903-255-0005. Renaissance Plaza, 1100 Dan Haskins Way, 55 years and older, one and two bedrooms. Call 903-831-7805. For leasing information for all properties, call Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Thank you very much for uh, continuing to tune in with us. We're here with Dr. Brian Matthews. And Dr. Matthews, before the break, we were talking about your mother and how she motivated you. So uh, continue to tell us about uh, your mom and the motivations that she provided for you. Uh, like, like we were saying before the break, my, my mother never made it an option, you know, as to whether I was going to go to college or not. Um, it was pretty much the expectation that whenever I graduated high school that I was going to go to, I was going to go to college. We had actually went and toured several colleges. Um, I distinctly remember it just like it was yesterday, uh, us actually going to Searcy, Arkansas and uh, getting a hotel room and actually the next day going to the campus and immediately she fell in love with the campus. Um, <clears throat> after I graduated high school, like I said, I actually went there, absolutely loved Harding. And we, even when I graduated, she encouraged me to, to stay in school. I was actually ready after about four and a half years of, of the undergraduate program, I was actually ready to get out into the real world. We all are. Right, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but um, she actually encouraged me to to, to stick in there. And one of the things that my mom used to always tell me is that you have to be uncomfortable for a little while to be comfortable later on. And that has actually proved to be the case even when I was going through the doctoral program. And, it, and it's very interesting because whenever I registered for classes, my academic advisor, he actually told me how, how strenuous, how much rigor the doctoral program uh, was going to entail and how intense it was and how I would have to sacrifice a, an abundance of time to dedicate to this actual program uh, because it was unlike my undergraduate degree, unlike pursuing my master's degree. And contrary to his advice, instead of taking one class per seven and a half week period, I actually took two. And you take two doctoral classes per seven and a half week period and combine that with being a single dad my son being in pre actually starting pre-k three and i'm you know working full time uh still have community um commitments and board obligations um but i never quit mm -hmm. and my my mom and my grandmother who was living at the time uh was definitely my motivation for continuing to push and one of the things that my professors would always tell me you're not going to have anybody around you that's actually doing what you're doing you know so so it's not like you're you're working at a fast food restaurant and everybody around you is doing the same thing or it's not like you're going to a football game and everybody's doing the same thing. You're actually pursuing a degree that only 1% of the U.S. population even attempts uh, to pursue and actually obtain. So you're going to be a part of that 1% that they can actually call doctor. So come December 2012, whenever I was able to walk across the stage and they said, congratulations, Dr. Brian Matthews, and I was able to be hooded, uh, it, it, it gave me a definite sense of accomplishment uh, that what my mom and what my grandmother had instilled in me at that time. And of course, by then, my grandmother had passed away. Uh, but I remember thinking of her um, as, I, as I walked across the stage. So definitely my mom and, and my grandfather, I don't want to leave him out. And of course, my dad and, and my grandmother were, are definitely uh, the catalyst by which uh, I was able to pursue something greater. Small town. Small town. 600 people? 
about 300. So 300 half, people half, I dealt with the people. <laughs> <laughs> so 300 people, small town, mm -hmm. uh, grandmother, uh, grandparents, uh, father, mother, motivating you to say, hey, you can do much better than what's expected from you in this small town. Exactly. And not only have you achieved being a, uh, having a doctor, an earned doctor, not one that you buy uh, from whatever services, right. <laughs> but you have an earned doctorate right. uh, from a certified university. <clears throat> and not only are you have an earned doctorate, but you also serve in a political office. Talk to us about why a political office and specifically with all of the other stuff that go on with when you run for political office, when you're in political office, why a political office? Again, it actually went back to just being a part of change. Uh, I, I sought counsel before before I ran. I uh, wanted to know what I was actually getting myself into, what pitfalls I needed to avoid. Uh, Derek McGarry, I, I would never forget it. He was actually one of my one of my mentors. And granted, even though Derek is, is not that much you know older than me, uh, he's an individual that had been doing it for a number of years. Um, I think whenever he uh, was elected to city council. He was the youngest member to ever be voted until the city council at that time. And so uh, I sought after him uh, for advice uh, as to, you know, what exactly does it mean to be a city councilman in, in, in this area? What does it mean to be a politician? What connotations are attached other than the generalized connotations with being a politician? What does it mean to be a politician here? Um, what roles did he travel down to, to serve his community and being able to listen to uh, the community's issues and what ideas that they have because they're the experts because they live in the community. So why not garner information from the people that actually live here? Um, you know, what ideas that we need to actually improve the community and things of that nature. And so, I mean, it is very